What happened to the Ark of the Covenant has fascinated scientists for centuries. It's hard to imagine a more compellingly mysterious object than the Ark, a box that was supposedly built according to God's own instructions. For the Israelites, it was the ultimate holy vessel. But having featured prominently in the Bible throughout the five books of Moses, the Ark disappears from the biblical narrative after the books of Chronicles, and its fate is left infuriatingly ambiguous over thousands of years. Recently, it was reported that scientists had found the Ark of the Covenant. But is that true? And is there any mystery behind the most sought-after Ark in history? I invite you to watch until the end of this video to discover all the mysteries. No one can open it. This legendary artifact is the ornate gilded case said to have been built some 3,000 years ago by the Israelites to house the stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written. Biblical accounts describe the Ark as large, about the size of a 19th century seaman's chest made of gold-plated wood and topped with two large golden angels. It was carried using poles inserted through rings on its sides. Only the priestly class, known as the Levites, could carry it. The Ark held not only the Ten Commandments, but also manna, a heavenly food God gave the Israelites in the desert, and Aaron's staff during the exodus from Egypt. Essentially, God's power lay within it, so no one was permitted to touch or open it. Those who tried died painfully. When the Philistines stole it, they suffered horrific diseases and death. Its supernatural powers also included bringing the Israelites' military victories against their enemies and enacting miracles in times of desperation. Of course, not everyone can open the Ark of the Covenant. But why do social media sites continuously report on scientists who have found the location of the Ark? There are two cases. First, they actually found the chest and opened it unharmed. To explain this, perhaps, scientists received permission from God to open the Ark of the Covenant. Or maybe those scientists are descendants of Levites. But because of some constraints, they cannot publish specific evidence other than recounts. This is understandable because if the Ark of the Covenant was so easily made public, God would have placed it in a place where everyone could see and touch it, not hidden in a deep place for a long time. Like that, okay. In the second case, there is absolutely no successful search happening here. Of course, this hypothesis is quite pessimistic, and I do not want to question anyone, especially scientists, those who have made great inventions or discoveries. But since it is a hypothesis, it must have two dimensions. So, audience, which hypothesis do you believe more? God hides the Ark for a reason. The Ark of the Covenant was a testimony to the power and wisdom of God. It was wonderful to behold and extremely dangerous to be around. Anyone touching it would die instantly. It had to be carried around by poles put through each side. Once, a centurion saw it was about to fall over and grabbed the corner to stabilize it. He only had the best of intentions, but he died instantly. In addition to searching for the Ark, for noble purposes such as searching for God's word or praying for his protection and teachings, some people have worse thoughts. They wanted to find the Ark of the Covenant to prove the existence of God. They did not believe in his presence until they saw the evidence with their own eyes. I mean, physically. Today, people would probably want to find it more to prove that God was real. And this may be the main reason that God had it hidden, because it's not what he wants. Unlike the ancient Israelites who were under a physical covenant, we're under a spiritual one, and we're to walk by faith, not sight. If we found the ark and proved God existed, we wouldn't be walking by faith. Or maybe the reason we can't find it is because it probably doesn't exist anymore. It drops out of historical texts around the time the Babylonians conquered Israel. The most plausible explanation is that it was hauled off as loot and was broken up for valuable materials. 
The Babylonians wouldn't have had much use for the Ark, but would have found a lot of use for its gold sheathing. Of course, I do not dare to confirm that this statement is completely correct. It's just that we have another perspective of reference. And the most important thing is still God's will. If he allows it, there will be some people who will be allowed to touch the Ark, which could be scientists. But if God does not allow it, the presence of this Ark will forever be something that modern people will never witness with their own eyes. Where is the Ark of Convenient now? The Ark is only fleetingly mentioned in the Old Testament after 2 Chronicles 35.3, in which King Josiah orders its return to the Temple of Solomon. Put the Holy Ark in the Temple built by Solomon, son of David, King of Israel. It is not to be carried around on your shoulders. This narrative suggests that the Ark was kept in the Temple of Solomon until the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC. During the invasion, the temple was looted and destroyed, and the Ark's whereabouts have been the subject of excitable speculation ever since. There are many theories about what happened to the Ark following the destruction of the Temple of Solomon. Some believe it was captured by the Babylonians and taken back to Babylon. Others propose that it was hidden away before the Babylonians arrived and that it's still hidden somewhere in Jerusalem. The book of Maccabees describes the prophet Jeremiah hiding the ark in a cave at Mount Nebo before Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Mount Nebo is where Moses saw the promised land before dying. If we accept what the book of Maccabees says, the ark may be buried within Mount Nebo in modern-day Jordan. Unfortunately, the government keeps tight restrictions on excavations. Another theory contends that the Ark was taken to Ethiopia by Manilik, the son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Indeed, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church claims to possess the Ark in the city of Aksum, where it is kept under guard in a church, but it has been dismissed by, among others, Edward Ullendorfu, a former professor of Ethiopian studies at the University of London, who claims to have examined it. They have a wooden box, but it's empty middle to late medieval construction when these were fabricated ad hoc. Another popular theory is that it lies under where the temple stood. However, this refers to the Temple Mount, perhaps the most sacred and disputed piece of land in the world. Right now, the Jewish and Muslim populations in Israel fight over the Temple Mount. Both claim ownership because of their religious beliefs. No excavations are allowed. Yet more questionable conjecture abounds. One theory posits that the Knights Templar took the Ark to France, and another suggests that it ended up in Rome, where it was eventually destroyed in a fire at the Basilica of St. John Lateran. The Ethiopian Connection Perhaps most famously, the Ark is said to be in the hands of the Ethiopian people. According to the Kebra Nagast, their nation's saga written in the 13th century, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had a child named Menelik. He went to Jerusalem to meet his father for the first time. When Menelik went back to Ethiopia, Solomon sent a group of young men to accompany him. They supposedly took the Ark with them, putting a fake in its place. Menelik proclaimed the Ark as a sign from God that his favor now rested with the Ethiopian people who shared Israel's inheritance. Menelik's descendant was supposedly none other than Haile Selassie. His ancient lineage was actually written into the Constitution. The Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Ethiopia claims to house the Ark. No one is allowed to see it, not even the patriarch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. They say that only a single monk is allowed in its presence to guard it. In the early 2000s, the patriarch Abune Paulos did express his desire to reveal the Ark to the world, but later changed his mind. Up to now, it remains unconfirmed that anyone has seen it, except for an ex-University of London professor. As a young soldier, he forced his way in to see it during World War II. He later said he found a model of the Ark, similar to those in other Ethiopian churches. Another claim comes from the Lemba, of South Africa, who states that the Ark passed through their lands. 
A replica of the Ark was in fact found in a cave in the 1940s, which sparked interest in the possibility that the Ark traveled that far. Excavations in Kiriath Jerim, Israel found a possible shrine where the Ark could have been. Yet this investigation did not draw any definitive conclusions. The Tabernacle In the book of Exodus, the Ark is constructed by God's instruction, which is given to Moses. The construction of the Ark and the Tabernacle, the portable shrine in which it would reside, was entrusted to a man named Bezalel, the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. The Israelites hauled the Ark wherever they went. While the Israelites were in the desert, the Ark remained in a tent, behind a curtain. This was the tabernacle. Eventually, the Ark came to Jerusalem via King David's conquest. His son, King Solomon, built the first temple and constructed the innermost area of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. This too lay behind a curtain and was so powerful and sacred that no one except the high priest could be in its presence once a year during the Day of Atonement called Yom Kippur. The Ark will be open at this time. The Ark plays a significant role, a holy weapon in the biblical stories of the exodus from Egypt and the conquest of Canaan. In both cases, the Ark is used as a tool to defeat the enemy. In Exodus, the Ark is carried into battle by the Levites, and its presence causes the Egyptian army to flee. In Joshua, the Ark is carried around Jericho for seven days, and on the seventh day, the walls of Jericho collapse. The Ark also has been linked to several of the Old Testament's miracles. It is said to have cleared impediments and poisonous animals from the path of the Israelites during the Exodus. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the Bible says that the river stopped flowing the moment the Ark Bearers set foot in it. The Ark is also mentioned in the story of Samuel, when God uses it to reveal His will to Eli, and in the Book of Kings, when the Ark is captured by the Philistines, but is eventually returned to Israel. Do you notice anything in common? That is the Ark that will appear in times of danger and help the people overcome danger, this is synonymous with the hypothesis that, once his children are threatened, he will reveal himself to protect his people. And that was also when the Ark of the Covenant appeared. The prophet Jeremiah also insisted that he wouldn't reveal the cave's location until the time that God should gather his people again together and receive them unto mercy. Or like the tabernacle became the first temple. Then the Ark of the Covenant disappeared but it will probably return when the third temple is formed. Then, God's temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of His Covenant was seen within His temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Following the Bible, the temple in heaven opened, and He saw the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. In Old Testament times, the Ark symbolized God's presence. It contained the tablets of the law, an urn of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The ark disappeared during the exile, but it never lost its significance. The ark's appearance in heaven indicates that God's presence and protection continue for his people. Wars and earthly calamities cannot destroy the ark's significance. Similarly, no power on earth can rob believers of the presence and protection of their Lord. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 holds Jesus' promise, I will never leave nor forsake you. Because of his promise, the writer of Hebrews writes in verse 6, So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? At the end of the trumpet judgments, powerful phenomena accompanied what John heard and saw in heaven. These same phenomena occurred at the end of the seal judgments, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, it seems all nature gave its amen to what God was doing. No one will find what was not meant to be found, since no one really knows what lies in it and what might happen if found, and somehow were to be opened, what will truly happen to the world since its power is not known. When the ark is opened. 
Upon its completion, the Ark was carried, using two poles, also fashioned from acacia wood and gold, into the tabernacle's inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, where it was placed beneath a gold lid known as the caporet, or mercy seat. Atop the mercy seat, two golden cherubim figures were positioned as instructed by God. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. It is suggested that the wings of the two cherubim form a space through which Yahweh would appear. Let's see how scientists were surprised by what's inside when they open it. Tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments were placed inside the Ark, beneath the outstretched wings of the cherubim, and a veil covered the Ark. The Ten Commandments showed that the moral law of God would forever stand before the presence of God. It also represented that the law would be kept in Christ. He would fully obey all the commands of God for His people. The Ark, as a container vessel, carried items that spoke to crucial moments of Israel's desert journey. The law, the Old Testament standard of righteousness, was represented by the second set of stone tablets. In Exodus 32, Moses crushed the original tablets when the Israelites created the golden calf to worship. The manna in the golden bowl symbolizes the life-sustaining sustenance that God provides for His people via Christ. The Lord supported Israel in the wilderness with this miraculous bread. They dubbed it manna, since they didn't know what it was. Manna means what is it? When Jesus fed the 5,000, he said, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The flesh and blood of Christ is life-sustaining food for the believer. Aaron's rod was the same rod that God transformed into a serpent in front of Pharaoh. The budding and flowering of the rod, however, was emphasized as more significant by the writer of Hebrews. The people of Israel began to complain about Moses and Aaron's leadership in Numbers, and the Lord had recently killed a bunch of rebels. To demonstrate Aaron's and his line's chosen priesthood, the Lord directed the tribes of Israel to lay out twelve staffs, with Aaron signifying the tribe of Levi, the tribe God ordained to the priesthood. The mercy seat was placed atop the ark. When the priest entered the Holy of Holies, he sprinkled the sacrifice's blood on the mercy seat. This signified Jesus' atoning blood. The sin of Israel created a barrier between God and them. Our sins have also kept us apart from God. Because of His holiness, God must view man through the lens of the law. How can an unrighteous man stand before the righteous God? The problem is solved by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Christ, like the blood on the mercy seat, stands between the law of God and the presence of God. The Lord's fury was satiated when He saw the blood. Through the blood of Jesus, the transgressions of God's people have been forgiven. Now the Lord sees believers not through the lens of the law, but through the lens of the gospel. Is the ark hiding away in a warehouse somewhere, as in the movie? Or is it simply waiting for us to discover it in a long-lost cave in the desert. We might not know for a while. Many claims remain unconfirmed. The only thing we can do now is wait. Waiting for God's will. If you agree, all mysteries will be revealed, including those related to the findings of scientists.